Hello. Welcome to the Dosing Off Podcast. I'm your host and narrator, Lance Lewis, and this is a podcast where I read you to sleep. I narrate short stories and classic literature in this deep and relaxing tone to help you put your overactive mind at ease and doze off. Tonight, I'll be narrating the first part of Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. Next week's episode will drop part two and finish the story. Whether you're listening to Dosing Off for the first time tonight, or you've been part of the Dosing Off community from the beginning, I appreciate you immensely for tuning in. And here we go. The Little Mermaid Far out in the ocean, the water is as blue as the petals of the loveliest cornflower, and as clear as the purest glass. But it is very deep, too. It goes down deeper than any anchor rope will go, and many, many steeples would have to be stacked one on top of another to reach the bottom to the surface of the sea. It is down there that the sea folk live. Now don't suppose that there are only bare white sands at the bottom of the sea. No, indeed. The most marvelous trees and flowers grow down there, with such pilant stalks and leaves that least stir. And the water makes them move about as though they were alive. All sorts of fish, large and small, dart among the branches, just as birds fit through the trees up here. From the deepest spot in the ocean rises the palace of the Sea King. Its walls are made of coral, and its high-pointed windows of the clearest amber. But the roof is made of mussel shells that open and shut with the tide. This is a wonderful sight to see, for every shell holds glistening pearls, any one of which would be the pride of a queen's crown. The sea king down there had been a widower for years, and his old mother kept house for him. She was a clever woman, but very proud of her noble birth. Therefore she flaunted twelve oysters on her tail, while the other ladies of the court were only allowed to wear six. Except for this, She was an altogether praiseworthy person, particularly so because she was extremely fond of her granddaughters, the little sea princesses. They were six lovely girls, but the youngest was the most beautiful of them all. Her skin was as soft and tender as a rose petal, and her eyes were as blue as the deep sea. But like all the others, she had no feet. Her body ended in a fishtail. The whole day long they used to play in the palace, down in the great halls where live flowers grew on the walls. Whenever the high amber windows were thrown open, the fish would swim in. Just as swallows dart into our rooms when we open the windows. But these fish now would swim right up to the little princesses to eat out of their hands and let themselves be petted. Outside the palace was a big garden with flaming red and deep blue trees. Their fruit glittered like gold, and their blossoms flamed like fire on the constantly waving stalks. 
The soil was very fine sand indeed, but as blue as burning brimstone. A strange blue veil lay over everything down there. You would have thought yourself aloft in the air with only the blue sky above and beneath you, rather than down at the bottom of the sea. When there was a dead calm, you could just see the sun like a scarlet flower with light streaming from its calyx. Each little princess had her own small garden plot where she could dig and plant whatever she liked. One of them made her little flower bed in the shape of a whale. Another thought it neater to shape hers like a little mermaid. But the youngest of them made hers as round as the sun. And there she grew only flowers which were as red as the sun itself. She was an unusual child, quiet and wistful and when her sisters decorated their gardens with all kinds of odd things they had found in sunken ships, she would allow nothing in hers except flowers as red as the sun and a pretty marble statue. This figure of a handsome boy, carved in pure white marble, had sunk down to the bottom of the sea from some ship that was wrecked. Beside the statue, she planted a rose-colored weeping willow tree, which thrived so well that its graceful branches shaded the statue and hung down to the blue sand, where their shadows took on a violent tint and swayed as the branches swayed. It looked as if the roots and the tips of the branches were kissing each other in play. Nothing gave the youngest princess such pleasure as to hear about the human beings up above them. Her old grandmother had to tell her all she knew about ships and cities and of people and animals. What seemed nicest to her of all the things was that up on land the flowers were fragrant, for those at the bottom of the sea had no scent and she thought it was nice that the woods were green and that the fish you saw among the branches could sing so loud and sweet that it was delightful to hear them. Her grandmother had to call the little birds fish or the princess would not have known what she was talking about for she had never seen a bird. When you get to be fifteen, her grandmother said, you will be allowed to rise up out of the ocean and sit on the rocks in the moonlight to watch the great ships sailing by. You will see the woods and towns, too. Next year, one of her sisters would be fifteen, but the others, well, since each was a whole year older than the next, the youngest still had five long years to wait until she could rise up from the water and see what our world was like. But each sister promised to tell the others about all that she saw and what she found most marvelous on her first day. Their grandmother had not told them half enough, and there were so many things that they longed to know about. The most eager of them all was the youngest, the very one who was so quiet and wistful. Many a night she stood by her open window and looked up through the dark blue water where the fish waved their fins and tails. She could just see the moon and stars. To be sure, their light was quite dim, but looked at through the water they seemed much bigger than they appear to us. Whenever a cloud-like shadow swept across them, she knew that it was either a whale swimming overhead or a ship with many human beings aboard it. Little did they dream that a pretty young mermaid was down below, stretching her white arms up toward the keel of their ship. The eldest princess had her fifteenth birthday, so now she received permission to rise up out of the water. When she got back, she had a hundred things to tell her sisters about, but the most marvelous thing of all, she said, was to lie on a sandbar in the moonlight 
when the sea was calm, and to gaze at the large city on the shore, where the lights twinkled like hundreds of stars, to listen to music, to hear the chatter and clamor of carriages and people, to see so many church towers and spires, and to hear the ringing bells. Because she could not enter the city, that was just what she most dearly longed to do. Oh, how intently the youngest sister listened. After this, whenever she stood at her open window at night and looked up through the dark blue waters, she thought of that great city with all of its clatter and clamor, and even fancied that in these depths she could hear the church bells ring. The next year, her second sister had permission to rise up to the surface and swim wherever she pleased. She came up just at sunset, and she said that this spectacle was the most marvelous sight she had ever seen. The heavens had a golden glow, and as for the clouds, she could not find words to describe their beauty. Splashed with red and tinted with violet. They sailed over her head. But much faster than the sailing clouds were wild swans in a flock. Like a long white veil trailing above the sea, they flew toward the setting sun. She too swam toward it, but down it went, and all the rose-colored glow faded from the sea and sky. The following year, her third sister ascended, and as she was the boldest of them all, she swam up broad river that flowed into the ocean. She saw gloriously green, vine-colored hills. Palaces and manor houses could be glimpsed through the splendid woods. She heard all the birds sing, and the sun shone so brightly that often she had to dive under the water to cool her burning face. In a small cove, she found a whole school of mortal children, paddling about in the water quite naked. She wanted to play with them, but they took fright and ran away. Then along came a little black animal. It was a dog, but she had never seen a dog before. It barked at her so ferociously that she took fright herself and fled to the open sea. But never could she forget the splendid woods, the green hills, and the nice children who could swim in the water although they didn't wear fishtails. The fourth sister was not so venturesome. She stayed out far among the rough waves, which she said was a marvelous place. You could see all around you for miles and miles, and the heavens up above you were like a vast dome of glass. She had seen ships, but they were so far away that they looked like seagulls. Playful dolphins had turned somersaults, and monstrous whales had sprouted water through their nostrils so that it looked as if hundreds of fountains were playing all around them. Now the fifth sister had her turn. Her birthday came in the winter time so she saw things that none of the others had seen. The sea was a deep green color, and enormous icebergs drifted about. Each one glistened like a pearl, she said, but they were more lofty than any church steeple built by man. They assumed the most fantastic shapes and sparkled like diamonds. She had seated herself on the largest one, and all the ships that came sailing by sped away as soon as the frightened sailors saw her there with her long hair blowing in the wind. In the late evening clouds filled the sky. Thunder cracked and lightning darted across the heavens. Black waves lifted those great bergs of ice on high, where they flashed when the lightning struck. 
On all the ships the sails were reefed and there was fear and trembling. But quietly she sat there upon her drifting iceberg and watched the blue forked lightning strike the sea. Each of the sisters took delight in their lovely new sights when she first rose up to the surface of the sea. But when they became grown-up girls, who were allowed to go wherever they liked, they became indifferent to it. They would become homesick, and in a month they said that there was no place like the bottom of the sea where they felt so completely at home. On many an evening, the older sisters would rise to the surface, arm in arm, all five in a row. They had beautiful voices, more charming than those of any mortal beings. When a storm was brewing and they anticipated a shipwreck, they would swim before the ship and sing most seductively of how beautiful it was at the bottom of the ocean trying to overcome the prejudice that the sailors had against coming down to them. But people could not understand their song, and mistook it for the voice of the storm. Nor was it for them to see the glories of the deep. When their ship went down, they were drowned, and it was as dead men that they reached the Sea King's palace. On the evenings when the mermaids rose through the water like this arm in arm, the youngest sister stayed behind all alone, looking after them and wanting to weep. But a mermaid has no tears, and therefore she suffers so much more. Oh, how I do wish I were fifteen, she said. I know I shall love that world up there and all the people who live in it. And at last, she came to be fifteen. Now I'll have you off my hands, said her grandmother, the old queen dowager. Come let me adorn you like your sisters. In the little maid's hair, she put a wreath of white lilies, each petal of which was formed from half of a pearl and the old queen let eight big oysters fasten themselves to the princess's tail, as a sign of her high rank. But that hurts, said the little mermaid. You must put up with a good deal to keep up appearances, her grandmother told her. Oh, how gladly she would have shaken off all these decorations and laid aside the cumbersome wreath. The red flowers in her garden were much more becoming to her, but she didn't dare to make any changes. Goodbye, she said. And up she went through the water, as light and as sparkling as a bubble. The sun had just gone down when her head rose above the surface, but the clouds still shone like gold and roses and in the delicately tinted sky sparkled the clear gleam of the evening star. The air was mild and fresh, and the sea unruffled. A great three-master lay in view, with only one of its sails set, for there was not even the whisper of a breeze, and the sailors idled about in the ringing and on the yards. There was music and singing on the ship, and as night came on, they lighted hundreds of such brightly colored lanterns that one might have thought the flags of all nations were swinging in the air. The little mermaid swam right up to the window of the main cabin, and each time she rose with the swell, she could peep in through the clear glass panes at the crowd of brilliantly dressed people within. The handsomest of them all was a young prince with big dark eyes. He could not be more than sixteen years old. It was his birthday, and that was the reason for all the celebration. 
Up on deck, the sailors were dancing, and when the prince appeared among them, a hundred or more rockets flew through the air, making it as bright as day. These startled the little mermaid so badly that she ducked under the water. But she soon peeped up again, and then it seemed as if all the stars in the sky were falling around her. Never had she seen such fireworks. Great suns spun around, splendid firefish floated through the blue air, and all these things were mirrored in the crystal clear sea. It was so brilliantly bright that you could see every little rope of the ship, and the people could be seen distinctly. Oh, how handsome the young prince was. He laughed and he smiled and shook people by the hand while the music rang out in the perfect evening. It got very late, but the little mermaid could not take her eyes off the ship and the handsome prince. The brightly colored lanterns were put out. No more rockets flew through the air and no more cannon boomed. But there was a mutter and rumble deep down in the sea, and the swell kept bouncing her up so high that she could look into the cabin. Now the ship began to sail. Canvas after canvas was spread into the wind. The waves rose high, great clouds gathered, and lightning flashed in the distance. Ah, uh, they were in for a terrible storm and the mariners were made haste to the reef the sails. The tall ship pitched and rolled as it sped through the angry sea. The waves rose up like towering black mountains, and as if they would break over the masthead, but the swan-like ship plunged into the valleys between such waves, and emerged to ride their lofty heights. To the little mermaid this seemed good sport, but to the sailors it was nothing of the sort. The ship creaked and labored, thick timbers gave way under the heavy blows, waves broke over the ship, the mainmast snapped in two like a reed. The ship listed over on its side, and water burst into the hold. Now the little mermaid saw that people were in peril, and that she herself must take care to avoid the beams and wreckage tossed about by the sea. One moment it would be black as pitch and she couldn't see a thing. Next moment the lightning would flash so brightly that she could distinguish every soul on board. Everyone was looking out for himself as best he could. She watched closely for the young prince, and when the ship split in two, she saw him sink down in the sea. At first, she was overjoyed that he would be with her, but then she recalled the human could not live under the water, and he could only visit her father's palace as a dead man. No, he should not die. So she swam in among all the floating planks and beams, completely forgetting that they might crush her. She dived through the waves and rode their crests, until at length she reached the young prince, who was no longer able to swim in that raging sea. His arms and legs were exhausted, his beautiful eyes were closing, and he would have died if the little mermaid had not come to help him. She held his head above water, and let the waves take them wherever the waves went. At daybreak, when the storm was over, not a trace of the ship was in view. The sun rose out of the waters, red and bright, and its beam seemed to bring the glow of life back to the cheeks of the prince, but his eyes remained closed.
The mermaid kissed his high and shapely forehead. As she stroked his wet hair in place, it seemed to her that he looked like the marble statue in the little garden. She kissed him again and hoped that he would live. She saw dry land rise before her in high blue mountains, topped with snow as glistening white as if a flock of swans were resting there. Down by the shore were splendid green woods, and in the foreground stood a church, or perhaps a convent, she didn't know which, but anyway, it was a building. Orange and lemon trees grew in its garden, and tall palm trees grew beside the gateway. Here the sea formed a little harbor, quite calm and very deep. Fine white sand had been washed up below the cliffs. She swam there with the handsome prince and stretched him out on the sand, taking special care to pillow his head up high in the warm sunlight. The bells began to ring in the great white building, and a number of young girls came out into the garden. The little mermaid swam away behind some tall rocks that stuck out of the water. She covered her hair and her shoulders with foam so that no one could see her tiny face. And then she watched to see who would find the poor prince. In a little while, one of the young girls came upon him. She seemed frightened, but only for a minute, then she called more people. The mermaid watched the prince regain consciousness and smile at everyone around him. But he did not smile at her, for he did not even know that she had saved him. She felt very unhappy, and when they led him away to the big building, she dived sadly down into the water and returned to her father's palace. She had always been quiet and wistful and now she became much more so. Her sisters asked what she had seen on her first trip up to the surface, but she would not tell them a thing. Many evenings and many mornings she revisited the spot where she had left the prince. She saw the fruit in the garden ripened and harvested, and she saw the snow on the high mountain melted away. But she did not see the prince so each time she came home sadder than she had left. It was her one consolation to sit in her little garden and throw her arms about the beautiful marble statue that looked so much like the prince. But she took no care of her flowers now. They overgrew the paths until the place was wilderness and their long stalks and leaves became so entangled in the branches of the tree that it cast a gloomy shade. Finally, she couldn't bear it any longer. She told her secret to one of her sisters. Immediately, all the other sisters heard about it. No one else knew, except a few more mermaids who told no one, except their most intimate friends. One of these friends knew who the prince was. She too had seen the birthday celebration on the ship. She knew where he came from and where his kingdom was. Come, little sister, said the other princesses. Arm in arm, they rose from the water in a long row, right in front of where they knew the prince's palace stood. It was built of pale glistening golden stone with marble staircases, one of which led down to the sea. Magnificent gilt domes rose above the roof, and between the pillars all around the building were marble statues that looked most lifelike. Through the clear glass of the lofty windows, one could see into the splendid halls with their costly silk hangings and tapestries, and walls covered with paintings that were delightful to behold. In the center of the main hall, 
a large fountain played its columns of spray up to the glass-domed roof through which the sun shone down on the water and upon the lovely plants that grew in the big basin. Now that she knew where he lived, many an evening and many a night she spent there in the sea. She swam much closer to shore than any of her sisters would dare venture, and she even went far up a narrow stream, under the splendid marble balcony that cast its long shadow into the water. Here she used to sit and watch the young prince when he thought himself quite alone in the bright moonlight. On many evenings she saw him sail out in his fine bow, with music playing and flags aflutter. She would peep out through the green rushes, and if the wind blew her long silver veil, anyone who saw it mistook it for a swan spreading its wings. On many nights she saw the fishermen come out to sea with their torches, and heard them tell about how kind the young prince was. This made her proud to think that it was she who had saved his life when he was buffeted about, half dead among the waves. And she thought of how softly his head had rested on her breast, and how tenderly she had kissed him. Though he knew nothing of all this, nor could he even dream of it. Increasingly she grew to like human beings, and more and more she longed to live among them. Their world seemed so much wider than her own, for they could skim over the sea in ships, and mount up into the lofty peaks high over the clouds and their lands stretched out in woods and fields farther than the eye could see. There was so much she wanted to know. Her sisters could not answer all her questions, so she asked her old grandmother, who knew about the upper world, which was what she said was the right name for the countries above the sea. If men aren't drowned, the little mermaid asked, do they live on forever? Don't they die as we do down here in the sea? Yes, said the old lady. They too must die, and their lifetimes are even shorter than ours. We can live to be three hundred years old, but when we perish, we turn into mere foam on the sea, and haven't even a grave down here among our dear ones. We have no immortal soul no life hereafter. We are like green seaweed. Once cut down, it never grows again. Human beings, on the contrary, have the soul which lives forever. Long after their bodies have turned to clay, it rises through thin air up to the shining stars. Just as we rise through the water to see the lands on earth, so men rise up to beautiful places unknown, which we shall never see. Why weren't we given an immortal soul? The little mermaid sadly asked. I would gladly give up my three hundred years if I could be a human being for only a day, and later share that in heavenly realm. You must not think about that, said the old lady. We fare much more happily and are much better off than the folk up there. Then I must also die and float as foam upon the sea, not hearing the music of the waves and seeing neither the beautiful flowers nor the red sun. Can't I do anything at all to win an immortal soul? No, her grandmother answered. Not unless a human being loved you so much that you meant more to him than his father and mother. If his every thought and his whole heart cleave to you so that he would let a priest join his right hand to yours and would promise to be faithful here and throughout all eternity, then his soul would dwell in your body and you would share in the happiness of mankind. 
he would give you a soul and yet keep his own. But that can never come to pass. That very thing is all the greatest beauty here in the sea. Your fishtail, which would be considered ugly on land. They have such poor taste that to be beautiful there, you have to have two awkward props, which they call legs. The little mermaid sighed and looked unhappily at her fishtail. Come, let us be gay, the old lady said. Let us leap and bound throughout the three hundred years that we have to live. Surely that is time to spare. And afterwards, we shall be glad enough to rest in our graves. We are holding a court ball this evening. This was a much more glorious affair than is ever to be seen on earth. The walls and the ceiling of the great ballroom were made of massive transparent glass. Many hundreds of rose red and grass green shells stood on each side of the rose, with the blue flames that burned in each shell, illuminating the whole room and shining through the walls so clearly that it was quite bright in the sea outside. You could see the countless fish, great and small, swimming toward the glass walls. On some of them the scales gleamed purplish red, while others were silver and gold. Across the floor of the hall ran a wide stream of water. And upon this the mermaids and mermen danced to their own entrancing songs. Such beautiful voices are not to be heard among the people who live on land. The little mermaid sang more sweetly than anyone else, and everyone applauded her. For a moment her heart was happy, because she knew she had the loveliest voice of all, in the sea or on the land. But her thoughts soon strayed to the world up above. She could not forget the charming prince, nor her sorrow that she did not have an immortal soul like his. Therefore she stole out of her father's palace, and, while everything there was song and gladness, she sat sadly in her own little garden. Then she heard a bugle call through the water, and she thought, That must mean he's sailing up there. He whom I love more than my father or mother. He of whom I am always thinking and in whose hands I would so willingly trust my lifelong happiness. I dare to do anything to win him and to gain an immortal soul. While my sisters are dancing here in my father's palace, I shall visit the sea which of whom I have always been so afraid. Perhaps she will be able to advise and help me. The little mermaid set out from her garden toward the whirlpools that raged in front of the witch's dwelling. She had never gone that way before. No flowers grew there, nor any seaweed. Bare and gray, the sands extended to the whirlpools, where like roaring mill wheels the waters whirled and snatched everything within their reach down to the bottom of the sea. Between these tumultuous whirlpools, she had to thread her way to reach the witch's waters, and then for a long stretch the only trail lay through a hot seething mire, which the witch called a peat marsh. Beyond it her house lay in the middle of a weird forest, where all the trees and shrubs were polyps, half animal and half plant. They looked like hundred-headed snakes growing out of the soil. All their branches were long, slimy arms, with fingers like wriggling worms. They squirmed, joint by joint, from their roots to their outermost tentacles, and whatever they could lay hold of, they twined around and never let go. The little mermaid was terrified and stopped at the edge of the forest. Her heart thumped with fear, and she nearly turned back. 
But then she remembered the prince and the souls that men have, and she summoned her courage. She bound her long flowing locks closely about her head, so that the polyps could not catch hold of them, folded her arms across her breast, and darted through the water like a fish. In among the slimy polyps that stretched out their rifing arms and fingers to seize her, she saw that every one of them held something that it had caught with its hundreds of little tentacles, and to which it clung as with strong hoops of steel. The white bones of men who had perished at sea and sunk to these depths could be seen in the polyps' arms. Ships' rudders and seamen's chests and the skeletons of land animals had also fallen into their clutches. But the most ghastly sight of all was a little mermaid whom they had caught and strangled. She reached a large muddy clearing in the forest, where big fat water snakes slithered about, showing their foul yellowish bellies. In the middle of this clearing was a house built of the bones of shipwrecked men. And there sat the sea witch, letting a toad eat out of her mouth, just as we might feed sugar to a little canary bird. She called the ugly fat water snakes her little chickabitties, and let them crawl and sprawl about her spongy bosom. I know exactly what you want, said the sea witch. It is very foolish of you, but the same you shall have your way, for it will bring you grief, my proud princess. You want to get rid of your fishtail and have two props instead, so that you can walk about like a human creature and have the young prince fall in love with you, and with him and an immortal soul besides. At this, the witch gave such a loud cackling laugh that the toad and the snakes were shaken to the ground, where they lay writhing. You are just in time, said the witch. After the sun comes up tomorrow, a whole year would have to go by before I could be of any help to you. Jay shall compound you a drought and before sunrise you must swim to the shore with it, seat yourself on dry land, and drink the drought down. Then your tail will divide and shrink until it becomes what the people on earth call a pair of shapely legs. But it will hurt. It will feel as if a sharp sword slashed through you. Everyone who sees you will say that you are the most graceful human being they have ever laid eyes on for you will keep your gliding movement and no dancer will be able to tread as lightly as you. But every step you take will feel as if you were treading upon knife blades so sharp that blood must flow. I am willing to help you, but are you willing to suffer all this? Yes, the little mermaid said in a trembling voice, as she thought of the prince and of gaining a human soul. Remember, said the witch, once you have taken human form, you can never be a mermaid again. You can never come back through the waters to your sisters or to your father's palace. And if you do not win the love of the prince so completely that your sake he forgets his father and mother, cleaves to you with his every thought and his whole heart, and lets the priests join your hands in marriage, then you will win no immortal soul. If he marries someone else, your heart will break on the very next morning, and you will become foam of the sea. I shall take that risk, said the little mermaid, but she turned as pale as death. Also, you will have to pay me, said the witch and it is no trifling price that I'm asking. You have the sweetest voice of anyone down here at the bottom of the sea, and while I don't doubt that you would like to captivate the prince with it, you must give this voice to me. 
I will take the very best thing that you have in return for my sovereign drought. I must pour my own blood in it to make the drink as sharp as a two-edged sword. But if you take my voice, said the little mermaid, what will be left of me? Your lovely form, the witch told her, your gliding movements and your eloquent eyes. With these, you can easily enchant a human heart. Well, have you lost your courage? Stick out your little tongue and I shall cut it off. I'll have my price and you shall have the potent drought. Go ahead, said the little mermaid.